So I want to start with a quote from John Gill, who is a really strong Reformed Baptist scholar, a Hebraic scholar, about the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. He says that this book was of use for the continuation of sacred history, meaning these books, Ezra and Nehemiah, are kind of a bridge. So we just finished up the historical books of 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. These books are telling us what happens after the kingdom of Israel and Judah ends. In the years, what? When did Israel get deported out of the land? We remember? I heard Judah. That was Judah, 586, right? What was Israel's date? 722, that's right. So, remember, Israel's deported by the Assyrians in 722, and then Judah is deported by the Babylonians in 586. So this is a bridge helping us get closer to Jesus' time. So he says this, this book is for the continuation to the, the point at the fulfillment of prophecies concerning the return of the Jews from captivity. How does God get Israel out of Babylon and back into the land? And of course, another issue is going to be how does he get Babylon out of Israel? So just because Israel's out of Babylon doesn't mean Babylon's out of Israel. It's the same problem, if you remember, in the exodus from Egypt. Remember, God got Israel out of Egypt, but he couldn't get Egypt out of Israel without the law, without the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. So, also the rebuilding of the temple. The temple was destroyed in Jerusalem in 586. And to give us an account of the state of the church in those times, the troubles and difficulties it met with, and what care was taken to keep the tribes and families distinct. Why? That it would be known from what tribe the Messiah, Jesus, will come from. So Ezra is going to end, and Nehemiah is going to have a section that's going to talk about marriages in the people of Israel, in particular, unholy marriages. And that section is given there because we need to know Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. And It'll, this, these three points are going to make a lot more sense tonight, I hope, as we travel through. So turn to Ezra chapter 1, please. We're going to start off right in the beginning of the book as we kind of fly over it tonight. And I want us to look at this introduction here. Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. So it, it begins and it says, In the first year of Cyrus king of Persia, so if you're taking notes, that's the year 538 BC, 538 BC, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord, the word of Yahweh, by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord, Yahweh, stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, Yahweh, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of Yahweh, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. We begin the book of Ezra and we just see the power of the sovereignty of God immediately. This is so contrast to everything we've studied the last weeks. We saw how prideful and arrogant the king of Assyria was, right? The king of Assyria said, I conquered the world because I'm so great, because my armies are so mighty. We even saw that in our Sunday morning series recently with the king of Assyria and Hezekiah, right, in that battle. We saw last week we, how Babylon was so prideful. Remember Nebuchadnezzar? This is my great city I've built. This is my kingdom I've built. And yet you see here the leader of now a new nation, a new empire, Persia, very humble. And he's talking by the Spirit of the Lord, and he's saying, it's God who's given me everything I have. Everything I have, the kingdoms that I control, including Jerusalem and Judah and Israel, all given to me by God. Everything's from God's hand. This is the sovereignty of God being recognized in his life. Now, notice he bases this off of the prophecy. Whoever's writing this book, which we'll get to in a minute, 
bases this off of the prophecy of Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah lived uh, much earlier. Jeremiah was way back at the beginning of the captivity of Judah when they were taken away to Babylon. So if, if you're thinking about this, Jeremiah is around the year 627 that he begins his prophetic ministry. I know we haven't gotten to the prophets yet, but that's where his ministry was. And this is 538, almost 100 years back. But what were those prophecies of Jeremiah? Well, um, we haven't studied them yet, so I'll just throw a few of them up there for you. Jeremiah 25, notice what God, what God says. This whole land will become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So God doesn't just say you're going to be sent to Babylon. He gives an explicit number, 70 years. God's very detailed. After 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their sin, declares Yahweh. Jeremiah 29.10, thus says Yahweh, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. So very clearly, God made an explicit prophecy, and here we have it being fulfilled. God is stirring up the spirit of Cyrus in the beginning of Ezra, and it's in fulfillment of the words of Jeremiah almost 100 years earlier that Judah would be in captivity 70 years, and then they would return to the land. So again, verse 3, whoever is among you of all this people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem. Why? To rebuild the house of the Lord. The temple's been in ruins since 586, over 50 years. And now he's saying, you're going to be able to go back and rebuild this temple in Jerusalem. Now, to give you a little idea of the chronology of these books, um, I want to just kind of give you a, a quick synopsis. So last week we were spending our time down here on the screen, right? And we were finishing up the reign of the kings of Judah in, in Chronicles. And so we spent a lot of time the last few Sunday mornings on Hezekiah. But uh, last week we looked at how God spared this one line of Judah. Remember, every king in Judah's line was a descendant of who? David, every single king, one dynasty, David. And if we look at this, 586, that's the end of the line of the kings. So Cyrus is making this decree at 538 BC. Very important. And this book, Ezra, is going to show us the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. That's the first half of the book. It's going to be all about the rebuilding of the temple. Here's the thing, Ezra doesn't show up until after that. Notice, Ezra goes to Jerusalem in the year 458. He was not a witness to this event. He wasn't there. He's going to be telling it to us secondhand. And then the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah doesn't go to Jerusalem until 444, way later. And he's not a witness to this either. And his book has a different theme. It's about the rebuilding of the wall. So Ezra is the rebuilding of the temple. Nehemiah is the rebuilding of the wall in Jerusalem. All of this orchestrated by God, stirring the heart of this man Cyrus. And later we're going to see Darius and then a third ruler of the Persians, Artaxerxes. Those three names are important. And by the way, there's overlap here with these names. You'll notice um, Josephus, who is a Jewish historian, we don't know if this is true or not, but he says that Daniel actually survived until uh, the time of Cyrus, that Daniel was Cyrus's prime minister as well. And he says that Daniel the prophet was involved in being a witness to King Cyrus, which led Cyrus to, to make this declaration in Persia. Now, we don't, the Bible doesn't say that. It's a great theory. It's a great idea. But you get kind of a general idea of, of the timing and the date of this book. But, but really, the, the whole point of all this, to start off the book, is I want you to see in Ezra chapter 1, beginning the book, that everything that we have should be looked at as a stewardship of God. 
This book is making it explicitly clear, whether it's God's house or in Nehemiah, it's the wall, um, it's our safety, it's our land, it's our return. Everything comes from the hand of God and his word. And we're going to see this especially throughout these two books of Ezra and Nehemiah, is the importance of a word-centered faith. It's the word of God that brings about the return to the land, the rebuilding of the temple, the rebuilding of the wall, and the revival of the faith of the people of God. Now, in terms of uh, talking about this book background-wise, before we get into the, the main themes of it, uh, it's important to say that originally the book of Ezra and Nehemiah were not two books. They were simply one book. So those of you who are new here tonight, um, we, in our English Bible, we follow the book order of the Greek translation called the what? Septuagint, the LXX, right? The Septuagint. Our English Bible is not following the order of the Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew Bible has three sections we've seen the last 18 weeks. It's called the Tanakh, which stands for what? What are the three sections? The Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. The Torah, the Law, the Navim, Prophets, Katuvim, the Writings. That's right. And so... What's interesting is the Jewish people, even today, if you get a Jewish Bible, there is no book of Ezra and Nehemiah. There's only the book of Ezra. These two were actually one book originally. And it wasn't until the Greek Septuagint, the Greek translation, that the two books were separated. They were cut apart. In fact, uh, it wasn't really until the year 200 where the church father Origen started leading Christians to have these books be separated into Ezra and Nehemiah. So here's the actual breakdown of the Jewish Bible. I didn't want you. I wanted to exercise your brains if you've been here. Um, so again, the Hebrew Bible's order: you have the Torah, Genesis to Deuteronomy. You have the Navim, which is the prophets, and then you have the Katavim, the writings. Last week we studied the end of the Hebrew Bible with studying the books of Chronicles. What you'll notice is that Ezra and Nehemiah are right at the end of the, of the Hebrew Bible. Second to last book of the Hebrew Bible. And they are called, I know probably no one here can read Hebrew, but that's the Hebrew word Ezra. Okay, so um, it's just a different order than our English Bible. Our English Bible follows the Greek translation. And if you're interested in understanding why that is, you can go back, I think, the third or fourth class online. We spend a lot of time talking about that. So originally, all of that to say is that um, these were not two separate books. God actually gave one book. We separated them later on, and that's how they end up in our English Bible. Now, the name Ezra means in Hebrew, Yahweh has helped. Yahweh has helped. And the name Nehemiah means comforted of Yah or Yahweh, comforted of the Lord. That's what these two names mean. They're beautiful names in the Hebrew language, and they're very important. Now, I want to talk about Ezra and the authorship of these books. I'm a very strong believer that Ezra was the author of both books, Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra is a phenomenally important character in the later history of, our Bible, of the Old Testament Bible and of the Jewish people. He is one of the most revered people to the Jews in terms of writers of scripture. Moses is number one, Ezra is number two. And unfortunately, most Christians don't know much about Ezra, which is really a shame because he's very important in our Bible. So turn to Ezra chapter seven, if you will, please. What we know about Ezra, we know Ezra was a priest and he was a scribe. In Ezra chapter 7, beginning at verse 1, we see Ezra's genealogy. And I want us to read, uh, scan it just quickly. And I want us to see, first off, that he is a descendant of the priest. And he is a priest. So Ezra 7, 
beginning at verse 1. Now after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia. So notice, if I back up just for a second, Artaxerxes, king of Persia, 464. The book starts in 538 with Cyrus. Now we're jumping to Artaxerxes, which is the time period of Nehemiah, or excuse me, of Ezra. So, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of, now you have his genealogy, Sarariah, Azariah, Hilkiah, these are all good priest names. If you jump down to verse 5, just because of time, the son of Abishua, the son of Phineas, if you've read Genesis to Deuteronomy, you know that name, the son of Eleazar, and the son of Aaron. Who is Aaron? Moses' brother and the first what? The first high priest of Israel. So Ezra is a priest in relation to Aaron. He's of the same tribe of Levi. He's a Levite and he's a priest. He's also a scribe by trade. He is a recorder of scripture and he is a professional scribe. So if you jump down, I think we can see very clearly that Ezra was involved in writing these books. Just because he wasn't, remember, we've seen this over and over in earlier books. Just because the author wasn't there doesn't mean they couldn't have recorded what happened. So look at verses 27 and 28. Ezra uh, records a letter from Artaxerxes, and then he begins to talk himself. Notice what he says here in 27 and 28. Blessed be Yahweh, God of our fathers, who has put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of Yahweh, which is in Jerusalem. And, notice what it says next, has extended mercy to who? To me. Now he's in the story, finally. To me, before the king and his counselors, and before all the king's mighty princes. So I was encouraged that the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. And I gathered leading men of Israel to go up with me. So basically, Ezra chapters 1 through 6 are events long before Ezra's life. As a scribe, God the Holy Spirit is giving him these words. He's writing them down. He's probably borrowing from historical sources that were written down as well. And then in chapter 7, picks up, he's writing with his own hand. And then uh, that goes through, right, through the book. And then he's probably taking the memoirs of Nehemiah to record for us the book of Nehemiah as well. And we'll get into that when we get to Nehemiah in just a little bit. Now, it's interesting. Just as Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, Genesis to Deuteronomy, we saw last week, Ezra is also um, proposed as being an author of First and Second Chronicles, right? So it's very possible that Ezra wrote the final four books of the Old Testament, Ezra, Nehemiah, and First and Second Chronicles, following the Jewish order of the books. Now, the Jewish tradition is that Ezra um, not only goes back to Jerusalem to reinstitute and rightly get the worship of God going as a priest, which we see in this book, but he also presided over the great synagogue of ancient Israel. Now, we don't have time tonight to get into what that means exactly, but if you study any Jewish sources or if you have a study Bible, there is a lot in your study Bible probably about the great synagogue of the Jews. And Ezra is believed to be the leader of it. There's one more important thing about Ezra. Jewish tradition says he is the author of the longest psalm in our Bible. Anyone know what number that is? 119. 119. We're reading through it right now on the Lord's Day. Ezra was the one that God used to give us Psalm 119, which every verse deals with the Word of God. So that is pretty cool indeed. Now, again, the historical setting of the book, just to make sure we get it. So Ezra chapters 1 through 6, 537 to 515 BC, during the, the era of Cyrus, right? Ezra 7, all the way through the end of Nehemiah, 458 to 435. 
again, uh, Ezra comes in 458, Nehemiah goes in 444, and his ministry ends in 433. So, just trying to help you understand where all this stuff is taking place at. And as we keep going, you know, this is important, especially when we get to the prophets. Um, you know, when you're in Haggai and Zechariah and these kind of sections, you really need to know when these books were taking place or else the prophets make no sense. And of course, I think the book itself makes a lot more sense when you know it was taking place. So this is kind of your historical setting to the book. So again, Kings and Chronicles end with the people in exile. Now, Ezra and Nehemiah are taking the people of God out of exile. And it's interesting that there is a crossover in this book. So, for instance, if you turn back a chapter to Ezra chapter 5 for a minute, if you'll notice here, Ezra chapter 5, verse 1. Again, knowing the context is important because it will help you understand other books of Scripture. Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedach, rose up to build the house of God. Crossover here, right? Now we're understanding that those first chapters, Ezra 1 through 6, they're taking place during the ministry of Haggai and Zechariah. See that? They're all interrelated. Just like you remember in our, in our sermon series right now on Sunday mornings, we're studying the life of Hezekiah. Who's the prophet who is around during Hezekiah? Isaiah, Isaiah right? We, if you didn't know that answer yet, you either haven't been here or you've been asleep for three Sundays because he's been a leading spokesperson in every passage, Isaiah. So these guys all don't live separate from one another. There is crossover in terms of their, of their appearance. Now, also, um, we see the same idea later in chapter 6. If you turn back to ch turn one four, chapter 4 to chapter 6, verse 14. Again, it says, The elders of the Jews, 614, built and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo. So just knowing this chronology will help you read Haggai and Zechariah. So in my Bible, I have written at the beginning. I'm not telling you you should write your Bible, but I like to write mine. I have written at the beginning of Ezra, Ezra 1 through 6, contemporaries, Haggai, Zechariah. Guess what I have written in the books of Haggai and Zechariah in the top of it? Ezra 1 through 6, contemporary to these prophets. Now we're putting all the stories together to understand the messages and what's going on and who's the leaders. It really helps me a lot be able to understand the Old Testament because these things are all very related. Now, an outline of the books. Because now we have these datings, it's very easy to outline the book. So again, Ezra, for our study purposes, is about the reconstruction of the temple and the worship of God. Nehemiah is about the reconstruction of the wall of Jerusalem. Those are the two major themes. And breaking them down, if, if I was going to teach a, a group of, uh, you know, Sunday, a Sunday school class or something, or a Bible study at my house, and I would say, all right, we're going to study the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. The first section, maybe the first month, would be chapters 1 through 6. The rebe rebuilding of the temple under Zerubbabel. And then the second section, the next month, is going to be 7 through 10. Now, Ezra rebuilds the people and the worship of God. He gets it right. And then, my third uh, month, going through these two books, would be on the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem under Nehemiah. And that would be the whole book of Nehemiah. That's an easy way to kind of outline the books and think about what is going on in them. Now, again, Ezra is... Two things. What is he? I just told you. He's a priest and he's a scribe. You can tell the man was a scribe. How many of you in this room, um, when you go to the grocery store, you make a list? All right. There's a few of you. The rest of us, we go and we spend too much money. Okay? <laughs> We're unprepared. Those of you who make lists are descendants of Ezra the scribe. Okay? <laughs> Scribes make lists. Scribes are detail-oriented. 
And Ezra and Nehemiah are packed with lists, which again points to a scribe being the author. So when you read other books of scripture, um, you know, you read, for instance, uh, not numbers, that's not a good, that is a lot of lists, a lot of chronology, um, numbers. Uh, let's say you uh, read the prophet Jeremiah, okay? Jeremiah, while he had worked in the court, he does not have lists, all right? He, his, uh, the way he thinks is not that way. Now, Isaiah, Isaiah was a brilliant literary scholar of his people. Flowing Hebrew does have lists in it. Um, Ezra is packed full of lists. So when you read Ezra, you're going to see he's a scribe because he's going to list out for you everything in the temple that is returned, which, by the way, is important. When we get to Daniel, and we, see, and we saw this in Second Chronicles too, when Babylon enters Judah and destroys Jerusalem and destroys the temple, it's very explicit. Nebuchadnezzar took what? All the articles out of of the temple. Very important. Because he was saying, my God is greater than your God. Do you remember when the Babylonian Empire fell? What did the king of Babylon eat on that night? The saucers from the temple in Jerusalem. He said, get out all the gold objects and we're going to drink and eat off them. And that was the day the handwriting was written on the wall in Daniel. I know we haven't gotten there yet. Many, many tekel uparsin, right? Your kingdom is taken away from you. Ezra makes it clear. God is now, through Cyrus, sending all of those sacred objects back to the land in restoration. Um, you see a very explicit list of who returned, their names. The leaders who returned with Ezra, those guilty of mixed marriages. We're, at the end of tonight, we're going to talk about mixed marriages, okay? Because that's something that is often criticized in these books wrongfully. Very important to understand what that's about. In Nehemiah, we get the names of everyone who built the wall. Why do we need to know those names? God wanted us to know because we had a scribe who was inspired by God to write it down, okay? New residents of the land. Priests and Levites who return with Zerubbabel. Very important indeed. Um, it's also interesting that, uh, oh, I went too far ahead. Well, I forgot a slide, that's okay. Um, in the books of Ezra, in the book of Ezra, there are sections in the book that are written in Aramaic, in correspondence. There's letters. So I think this is actually in your notes if you have the notes. I'm sorry I don't have it on the screen, but the letter in chapter 4, the letter in chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7, all are not in Hebrew. They were actually written in Aramaic. Now, we've said in this class time and time again, the majority of the Old Testament was written in the Hebrew language. However, however, in Daniel and Ezra, there is some Aramaic. Here is an Aramaic section right here. All right, in these letters, they are actually God inspired the Bible in the Aramaic language. So, again, very authentic, just the way a scribe meticulously researched and detailed these letters. So, you see these letters in 4, 6, and 7. Um, God preserved them so they could be in our Bible. Now, the, one of the, the big points in Ezra that it shows up in the New Testament is the issue of the Samaritans. The Samaritans. And they're also going to show up in Nehemiah. Now, who are the Samaritans? So let's just do a quick recap, because not all of us have been here the last weeks. So there's one kingdom of Israel under David and Solomon. The kingdom splits with Solomon's son, Rehoboam, and now a new king in the northern country, Jeroboam. So there's one nation, Israel. Because of sin, the nation splits into two nations, Jeroboam in the north, Rehoboam in the south, Israel and Judah. You remember that. Now, uh, 
the nation of Israel had very few godly kings. They were judged first in the year 722 B.C. They were removed from the land of Israel by the Assyrians. We've studied all this stuff in detail in previous weeks. The king of Assyria brought people not from that area into the land to live there. And they married the few poor people who were left in the land of northern Israel. These people are called Sumerians and later Samaritans, okay, in the New Testament, because they're from Samaria. So can we think in the New Testament of a particular individual from Samaria who is not looked on as a good figure by anyone but Jesus initially. The woman at the well in John chapter 4. She was from Samaria, and they can't, the disciples can't understand why Jesus has even talked to her. Jews and Samaritans don't talk to one another, right? Anyone else? Jesus tells a story. The parable of the Good Samaritan, right. That was supposed to be a theological punch in the face of the Jewish people. The only good guy, the hero of the story, is one of those Samaritans of that other ethnicity. All of this contention comes back to Ezra and Nehemiah. It actually starts here. So look with me at Ezra chapter 4 for a minute. There is a rift in Ezra chapter 4. So in the beginning of the book, they're trying to rebuild the temple. In Jerusalem and of course uh, there are enemies to the Jewish people who are trying to stop them from building the temple and in Ezra chapter 4 we read about this I'm going to see let's pick up in verse 6 actually start at verse 1 and we're going to skip around a little Ezra 4.1. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's house and said to them, let us build with you. If you jump down to verse 3, Zerubbabel said, you may do nothing with us to build a house for our God. We alone will build to Yahweh, God of Israel, as King Cyrus, king of Persia, commanded us. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in building and hired counselors to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, the king of Persia. So... Who are these people? They're the Samaritans from Samaria. And as you know, in the New Testament, in John 4, we read that the Samaritans have their own temple where? In Mount Gerizim, right, in Samaria. They built a rival temple to the temple in Jerusalem. All this goes back to right here. This animosity starts here. They don't want the Jews to have a new temple in Jerusalem. They want their temple to be the temple. They're not doing it God's way, they're doing it their way. So they're opposing the temple of God, the rebuilding of the temple. Now, this rivalry, rivalry continues on. When the Jews are trying to build the wall in Nehemiah's day, guess what? The enemies of God's people try to discourage them and stop them from building the wall. Why are these things recorded in these stories? I think they're recorded to remind us what Jesus said. If the world hates me, what? They're also going to hate you. All right? If the master of the house is treated this way, the servant should not expect any different. Okay? Jesus said to the believer, in this world you will have tribulation. The Christian faith... The faith of God is not a bed of roses. It's a struggle. It's a battle. So this racial tension begins here. And the beauty of Jesus in the New Testament is what? Not only does he talk to the woman at the well, overcoming racism. He drinks out of her pitcher, 
which a Jew never would have drank after a Samaritan, overcoming the racism. He also uh, shows there's no distinction between male or female, right? He overcomes the rabbinic sexism of the day. Men weren't allowed to talk to women. According to rabbinic laws, that was sexist. Well, excuse me, they didn't think it was sexist. They thought it was the right thing. And Jesus is saying, no, women are made in the image of God. I'm a, I can speak to them. They need the gospel, right? They're not secondary citizens. And so Jesus overcomes all of that stuff that's built up in Ezra and Nehemiah and then is compounded. Now, what's very cool about Ezra and Nehemiah is the emphasis on the way the temple gets rebuilt, the way the people get rebuilt, the way the wall gets rebuilt, only comes by the word of God. You can't do anything without an emphasis on the word of God. You can't live your life without the word of God. Jesus said, man, in Matthew 4, 4, what? Man should not live by what? But every word that proceeds from where? You're supposed to let me drink water and make the answer to the question. It's teamwork here. By every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. These books are so word of God centered. Again, how did Ezra begin? Yahweh, the Lord, through the prophet Jeremiah, stirred the heart of Cyrus to send the people back to the land. We're going to see Ezra is a word centered leader. Look at Ezra chapter 7 now, verses 6 through 10. And then I want to look at the, re the revival in Nehemiah's day. There's an awesome revival in Nehemiah's day as well that is word-centered. Ezra 7, 6 through 10. <clears throat> it says there, This Ezra went up to Babylonia, went up from Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that Yahweh, the God of Israel, had given. And the king granted him all that he had asked, for the hand of Yahweh his God was on him. And there went up also to Jerusalem, in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king, some of the people of Israel, and some of the priests and Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, the temple servants. Now just pause for a minute. Remember, the temple's already been rebuilt. Ezra is going to rebuild the worship and the people of God in Jerusalem. So notice what it says next. Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was the seventh year of the king. On the first day of the month, he began to go up from Babylonia. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem. For, I love this, the good hand of his God was on him. God's providential care. That sounds like the New Testament. What did Jesus say? John 10. No one will what? Remove you from my Father's hand or from my hand. John 10. Pluck you. King James. I like that the pluck imagery a lot actually i like that verbiage um so look at verse 10 ezra set his heart to study the law of yahweh and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in israel i actually um not long ago downtown at the library i'm a sucker for buying rare bibles old bibles uh i just love collecting them and i've wanted for a while a leather copy of the 1977 New American Standard Bible Translation, which is way out of date. But it's a really unique translation because most people use the 1995 New American Standard. But um, it still was very super poetic in the Psalms and used these thys and thous, but it modernized everywhere else. It's just a very unique edition. And I happened to find one at the used sale at the library downtown. And so... You know, probably 500 people had went through that day and passed by that thing, and I saw it. To me, that was worth $100, you know? It was only a buck. Yes. Genuine leather, beautiful. And so I opened it up, because I'm always curious to see who was the first user of the Bible, right? And by the way, this does not mean for you to go buy your pastor old Bibles and uh, <laughs> let me know what it is first, because got to be, I got a, a niche, you know? I don't need everyone. Um, just to clarify, because whenever I say something like that, someone will bring me something I don't need. Yeah, so that one was waiting for me. But um, I opened it up, and what was really cool was the, the first owner of it had written in the front of the Bible, Ezra 
chapter 7, verse 10. Ezra set his heart to study the law of Yahweh, to do and teach his statutes and rules in Israel. And I thought, that's cool. That's a good verse to write in the front of your Bible. Good job. And um, I still read out of that Bible a lot. I like it. It's a good one to read out of. So, all that to say, um, that's a great verse, maybe, to write in the front of your Bible. Set your heart to study the law. And it's not enough to study it. Don't just be a hearer of the word. Do it and teach it. All right? James says the same thing. Don't be just a hearer of the word. Be a doer of the word. Great advice. Now, turn to Nehemiah chapter 8. I want us to see the great revival in Israel that is recorded by Ezra in Nehemiah 8. This is a, a great passage. And uh, preparing for tonight, just kind of reading through, thinking about sharing this. I realized I haven't actually preached Nehemiah chapter 8 in like 14 years. So I was like, that, I'm going to have to fix that someday, soon. And this is such a powerful revival section for the people of God. So Nehemiah chapter 8, if you'll look there with me, please. So it says here, and again, remember, they're rebuilding the wall in Nehemiah. Correct? They were built to protect from enemies. Okay? All the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate in Jerusalem. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that Yahweh had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard. I love that. See, the children were present. One of the reasons why we have children in worship is passages like this. All right? We don't believe in splitting families apart on, on the Lord's Day. We think it's important that the family's together. This is one of the reasons why. There was little ones there we're going to read. So, it says next, And he read from it, facing the square, before the water gate, from early morning, which, by the way, that is not 10 a.m., okay? <laughs> not Pensacola early morning. <laughs> Until midday in the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. Verse 4. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood, which they had made for the purpose. That's why most churches have a chancel and a wooden pulpit. And beside him at his right hand stood Mattiah, Shema, Ananiah, Urijah, Hilkiah, Maasiah, and in his left hand, Pedaiah, Mishael, Malchijah, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed Yahweh, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads, and they worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Look at verse 8, only because I don't want to have to work on my uh, pronunciation tonight. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. It's interesting. Number one, this worship service was all about the reading of the Bible. All right. Reading of scripture is an ordinance for the people of God. It's not, it's, it, it's sad. As a Baptist pastor, I've preached in a lot of churches over the years, and I've attended, when I go on vacation, I usually go to like four or five church services on Sunday, you know, I'm a, a service junkie, I want to get to as many as I can, uh, just to be with people of God in other places, see what's going on in the world. One of the most grievous things to me in the modern church is that churches don't have public reading of scripture as a part of the worship. 1 Timothy 4.13 gives it as an explicit command, until I come, give attendance to reading to exhortation, to doctrine. That is an explicit command for the worship service, to publicly read the Bible in worship. Now, not only is that the case, but it was from morning, which in Hebrew, your translation might have a little note there, means the light of day. All right? For those of you guys and gals that are vets, that's daybreak, okay? All right? Yeah, thank you. Um, from the morning, probably six hours of listening to the word of God read and preached, and all the ears of the people were attentive to the law, not to their cell phones, right? Not to uh, 
daydreaming and the, the snores of their neighbor. Um, no, they were attentive to the word of God. Number one, they came to hear from God. That's why in our pastoral prayers, we always pray that the people of God would hear the word of God, not just hear it here, hear it here, hear the word of God. And we have 14 men listed standing around this pulpit of wood in which he's reading the scripture. And what I love about this passage is they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. That's what we call expository preaching. X out of, you're pulling out of what the text says and giving the sense to the people. You're not reading into the Bible what you want it to say. You're pulling out of it what it actually says and sharing it. That's where we get that idea from. Very important. A lot of pastors, unfortunately, have not been trained to do that. And so they say, you know what? This Sunday, I want to preach about lying. Let me find a passage that teaches about lying. You know, this Sunday, I want to preach about politics. Let me find a passage that talks about the king or something or the law. Instead of saying, no, I'm going to read the Bible and whatever it says, I'm going to take out of it. And that'll be what my sermon is. Right. That that was kind of the idea here. And there's probably a translation issue as well, um, because, again, what language are these people now speaking? Are they speaking Hebrew anymore? They're speaking Aramaic now. The Old Testament was written in what language? Hebrew. These are cognitively f friendly languages, but they are not identical languages, and so they had to even do some translating. So, hence, why we prefer modern translations, because we don't want to have to you know, translate twice, from Greek to Hebrew to Elizabethan English to modern English. Nothing wrong with the King James. It's a beautiful translation. I just told you I use a 1977 New American Standard with these eyes and nows because it's beautiful. I like it. And I love the King James. I've read from it my whole life, and I still do it at many times. But it is helpful for those hard words to have a modern translation in our own language. And that is exactly what's going on here. Now, I want to end on one more point because we're out of time, and I wanted to spend time in prayer. So, um, one more point, and that is, so if you're in your notes, I'm going to jump down a little bit, but... That is the issue of mixed marriages. So in Ezra and Nehemiah, there in Nehemiah chapter 13 and at the end of Ezra, and let's turn to, turn to Ezra 6. Let's turn there for a minute. In both of these books, uh, we see that when Ezra enters the land, he finds the Jewish people marrying non-Jews, okay? And this is very grievous to him. And so, at the end of Ezra, he actually commands people to get a divorce and to divorce their spouses, which is really shocking in Ezra chapter 10 because God happens to say that he hates divorce, right? Now, divorce is a forgivable thing. We believe in restoration after divorce etc. But it's weird to read a scribe and priest commanding people to get divorced. And the reason why, maybe if on, on an uncareful reading of this passage, is that these people were of different ethnicities. God, and then even farther, people in the 1950s, and probably earlier, really since evolutionary thinking, since the theory of evolution became prevalent, and races, that idea was developed, people began to say, see, the Bible's against interracial marriage because Ezra made the Jews divorce the non-Jews because they were non-Jews. And so you had a lot of racist, bigoted, hateful people um, who said that so-called Caucasians can't marry Asians and that those who are of African descent can't marry Caucasians, and that those of Latin American descent can't marry Caucasians. And they used Ezra and Nehemiah as an argument for this, which is absolutely terrible argumentation, and unbiblical and ungodly and, and wrong, okay? So we know there's one race, the human race, in Adam, Ethnicities are a beautiful thing. You can, there's no such thing as interracial marriages. There's only one marriage. There's only one race, the human race. 
All right, there's only one race, Adam's race. And so that being the case, why does he make them divorce? Well, when Ezra shows up in Ezra chapter 6, I want you to notice here what is said here. It says, um, let me actually read the context, just it would be more helpful to you. Verse 19. And the descendants of the captivity kept the Passover meal on the 14th day of the first month. For the priests and the Levites had purified themselves. All of them were ritually clean. And they slaughtered the Passover lambs for all the descendants of the captivity, for their brethren the priests, and for themselves. Then the children of Israel who had returned from the captivity ate together with all who had separated themselves from the filth of the nations of the land in order to seek Yahweh God of Israel. And they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy. For Yahweh made them joyful and turned the heart of the king of Assyria toward them to strengthen their hands. Now turn to Ezra chapter 10, please. Turn there. So, um, what was the issue in Ezra 6? The issue was... These people could eat of the Passover if they had separated from the uncleanness or the filth of the peoples of the land to worship the Lord. The issue was not marrying someone of a different ethnicity. The issue was marrying someone who didn't worship the Lord. That was the issue, which is the same issue in the New Testament. Don't be unequally yoked. So, in Ezra chapter 10, uh, actually start in chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 14. Ezra is praying and confessing sin. I don't have it on the screen. Notice what he says. Should we again break your commandments and join in marriage with the people committing these, what? Abominations. 9, 14. He is concerned about marriages in which you've got people sacrificing children and infants to pagan gods marrying those who supposedly worship Yahweh, the true God. It's not about race. It's about faith. That's the issue here. Now, the New Testament does not can command a believer to divorce a non-believer. If they're married, you're in covenant, you should try to sanctify them and lead them to Christ. But remember, Israel has just come back to the land. They are very weak, and they're already flirting with idolatry. So, in Ezra chapter 10, it's a very unique passage. Look at verse 10. Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have transgressed and have taken... It doesn't say foreign wives. What does it say? Pagan wives. And added guilt to Israel. Make confession to Yahweh, the God of your father. Do his will. Separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the pagan wives. They had just married them. This was a recent act, and he's saying, hey, because this is the same thing Moses said, because of the hardness of your heart, separate yourself, divorce. Because we can't have the worship of God here if all of you new believers are now married to pagans who will corrupt the worship of God. So again, this is not about race. This is about faith, about pagans, about those who don't set their hearts on the things of God. The same thing shows up later in Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 23 to 29. Remember, last point, and we're done. How did Solomon lead Israel into sin in 1 Kings? What did he do? What was the sin of Solomon? He married a bunch of different women who were what? Pagans. And he built high places and even temples. Ezra knows what happens when this goes on. And so he records this for us so we know the importance of marriage in the faith. And again, the New Testament makes it very clear that marry a believer. But if you are married to an unbeliever, stay with them, be faithful, seek to sanctify them. If they depart, you're not...